thank you for tuning in. We are on episode 7 of 20. Episode 7 is titled Block Betting and Feeler Bets and why they're important. Now, one thing I'm going to mention uh, as we go along on the video, I'm going to answer a few of the questions that I saw from episode 6 and comments that people had. But real quick, when you're doing block betting, it's very important that when you're doing a block bet that you either do it often enough that it disguises your betting as some type of value bet, okay? And we're gonna get into exactly what is block betting, okay? So block betting, what is it? It's essentially when someone bets, and this could be you, it could be somebody else, and they don't wanna get raised. Do not want to get raised, okay? Do not want to get raised. Or when someone bets and they're feeling people out. This is what's called a feeler bet or a feeler bet. They got to find out where are they, okay? Or in your situation, you might say, where am I in the hand, okay? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, I posted on one of my blogs earlier on a live play where I made a mistake of somebody did a feeler bet on me and I played a little conservative because I was up so much instead of just ripping it in and I'll get into that for a second. So block betting is, uh, I've talked about this a couple of times, particularly on the river, uh, when people do a river block bet where there's something like $800 in the pot and they'll bet out something like a quarter pot, like 225, somewhere in the 200 to 250 range. You know, uh, they're doing a block bet, which basically means, please don't raise me, please, please don't raise me. It's the same thing, like a feeler bet. Please, I wanna find out where I'm at. Am I ahead, am I not ahead? Okay, so block betting, you should be incorporating it into your play enough that you are doing it often enough to where it looks like a value bet. If you just do it when you're block betting, uh, really good PLO players like myself are gonna pick up on this. And uh, we're gonna start min raising you, like I said on the last episode, which was, uh, or not the last episode, but the previous episode when it comes, or yeah, the last episode when it comes to river betting. And uh, when somebody will do a block bet, well, they'll bet like 200 or 250 into an $800 pot. One of the easiest ways you can win that pot is by raising. Um, now, obviously everything's situational. I know there's people on the internet who are like, oh, you're completely wrong. People do that all the time. But generally speaking, if somebody's gonna block bet, that means they don't wanna be raised, okay? And you can block bet in any denomination, okay? So this goes into one of those questions somebody asked me about here, you're gonna cover micro stakes and stuff like that, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But it doesn't even matter. Say you're playing uh, 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 smaller stakes, like say you're playing 1-1 PLO, or say you're playing online and it's a quarter cent, 50 cent, that's not what this video is about. But let's say, even if the, the pot has $5 in it, okay or fifty dollars it doesn't matter if they're not doing a full size pot size bet to charge you maximum to your draws and on a five dollar pot say they're betting like a dollar 25 or on a fifty dollar pot you know say they're betting 10 bucks they're really doing that as a i want to show strength but i don't want to show too much strength okay so what you have to start doing is is when you have the stone cold nuts from time to time or you feel like you have the best hand Okay, you have to start doing what looks like block betting. You have to start disguising your block betting because what it's going to do is it's going to induce a raise. Okay, so let's take an example. Let's say a flop comes King Jack Eight, uh, Rainbow. Okay, now that's a decently draw heavy board. Nine, ten, Queen, uh, Ace, Queen, Ten, Nine. I mean, there's a lot of wraps out there. But let's say you have Jack-Jack, and let's just say you have some blockers. Say you have Jack-Jack-9-9, nine, nine, okay? So you flop middle set, okay? You obviously don't have the nuts, but say it comes around to you, and it doesn't matter. Let's assume that they're, you're on an average table, and there's four ways to a flop, so there's somewhere between $100 and $150 in the pot. Again, this is all pertaining to a one two five. Uh, with a straddle of 10 and typically your starting stack is going to be a thousand dollars. Okay uh, But say you have a set of jacks Whether you're first to act or last to act you should start incorporating some of those blocker bets in where If you have a hand like a wrap, you're probably not going to bet pot You know the flop's going to come up say there's hundred and twenty dollars in the pot and you decide to put a blocker or a feeler bet out there 
and you bet something like 60 to 75 bucks, okay? Now on the flop, I'm not gonna go crazy. If I think it's, if you're doing a blocker bet and I feel like I have the strongest hand, I'm not gonna go crazy on the flop, but I'm gonna go crazy on the turn. So let's say you get two callers, so you're going three ways to the flop, Let's just make it easy. Say you bet 60 bucks into a $120 pot, okay? So now you have $300 in the pot going into the turn, okay? And you decide to do another blocker bet because the turn's a complete blank. Say the turn brings out like a three, okay? Does not change anything, even if it brings in a backdoor draw. It really doesn't change that much. Then let's say it gets to you in your three ways. You can do another blocker bet for like $125. And if there's somebody who has a set of eights, if you have done this several times through playing and they've been paying attention, they're following you, what kind of blocker bets you do, and you're betting 125 into 300, and I know some people are like, wait, professor, you're giving people the wrong odds. Keep in mind, everything's dependent. Everything's situation dependent. If you put them on a full wrap draw and, uh, and a three comes, yeah, you may consider betting pot. Bet 300, get rid of the, the, the you might get rid of the draws, you might not. But if you bet 300, you're really stepping it on the gas because what well, looks like a blocker bet on the flop all of a sudden now looks like what I call a go away bet, okay? Anytime, just a side note, anytime there's like five or six way action for $100 pre-flop and there's $600 in the flop and the flop's like queen seven deuce rainbow and somebody bets 600, I call that a go away bet. That means go away. I don't want any more action. I want to take down this pot. They're losing so much equity if they have queen seven, set of seven, set of queens, they're losing so much equity. But in any case, uh, that's what I call a go away bet, where you're pretty much betting pot and you don't want anybody to call. So in this situation, if you bet 125 and you are playing on an average table where there might be one or two experienced PLO players like myself, I might look at that and say, huh, I got a set of eights. That three certainly didn't change anything and you really don't act like you're really wanting to grab a hold of this pot by the teeth. I'm gonna pot it into you. And that's when you're gonna be super happy if you've got something like a set of kings or a set of jacks. In this situation, we're gonna have a set of jacks with blockers, okay? The reason why the blockers are so important is because it's less likely to put somebody on a draw. Plus, if they have something like ace, queen, 10, or 10, queen, x, queen, 10, queen, nine, you are blocking some of their outs. Anyway, so you're okay knowing that you have some of their outs to let them to draw. But in this situation, pot, again, is three times this plus what's behind. So pot ends up being, you know, 375 plus 300 ends up being 675. And at that point, you need to make a decision. Well, the three didn't change anything. Is this a really tight person who has just been slow playing pocket kings behind? Maybe. Are they check raising now? They might be check raising. If they're check raising, they might have a set of kings. They could be check raising with a set of eights. Like I can see a set of eights betting pot into you after you bet this. I can see King Jack doing that. I can even see some combo hands like Ace, King, Queen, Jack, in which case, again, you're, you, you're, you're, you're doing really well against them uh, equity-wise. Um, but so blocker betting is when somebody bets and they don't want to be raised, okay? And what you need to do as a player, especially when you're playing low stakes PLO and block betting gets a little bit more into higher stakes PLO and a little bit more experience, which is fine. But what you want to do when you're playing low stakes PLO is mix in your block betting with as many times as you're betting pot and you have the same hand. Disguise your betting. Because one of the things that experienced PLO players will tell you uh, time and time again, and, and again, I'm one of them, is when somebody bets a specific amount into the pot, we kind of have an idea of what kind of hand you have. Okay, well, when I say we, I mean the collective PLO group of people who've been playing for years on end myself as the PLO professor. Generally speaking, if you do a block bet, I'm very much well aware of it, and, uh, or a feeler bet, okay? And there's different types of feeler bets you can do, and I'm gonna transition into that, and I'm gonna give you a, a true story that happened to me, oh, probably like seven weeks ago. Uh, here I was, I was playing 5'10", 5'5", 10, uh, 10, or 5'5 five, five with a rock, so it's 5'5", five, five, 10, and then you can straddle the rock, which makes it 20. And uh, uh, in any case, we were, we were pretty deep stacked. I think I had like 4,000 in front of me, somewhere around there. Max buy into the game is like three grand or so. But uh, in any case, um, my hand, uh, the, 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 the whole flop uh, on the flop ended up being an ace, a six, and a four, okay, with, uh, with two diamonds. And 
the I did a blocker bet on the flop because I had a pair of aces uh, with nut diamond draw. I had ace four uh, with diamonds, so I had good equity. So it ended up being about a hundred dollars pre flop, and we went to the flop. Uh, what was it? Three way? Yeah, it was three ways to the flop. So there's about three hundred dollars in the flop. Flop comes ace deuce, ace four six with two diamonds. I've got ace four. Uh, I actually have ace, king, queen, four with two diamonds, okay? And ace, king, queen is a pretty strong hand. But I remember uh, the reason why I didn't re-raise is because I was way out of position. I was first to act. But the flop comes ace, ace, six, four with two diamonds. I go ahead and I lead out for 125. And this was kind of a, a feeler bet. This is like if you have ace, king, I outflopped you. I have two pair. You know, also I have a draw. I don't even mind getting raised in this situation. But I went ahead and bet 125 and I got one caller. Okay, so now we're going to the turn and we've got 550 in the pot. And the turn brings up a jack. It was a black jack. And so what I did is I bet half pot, 225. Again, this is kind of a blocker bet, kind of a feeler bet. I'm like, I still have two pair. I don't have ace jack, but I still have two pair. And uh, I think I've got the best hand here. You know, really what I'm targeting is any kind of straight draws at this point. And when I bet 225, the guy raised. He raised to 725, okay? And we're both about 2100 to 2300 effective, somewhere around there. Even when he makes it 725, he has like another 1600 behind. And I made a mistake. Everybody's allowed to make mistakes, but I should have taken a moment and taken a second to realize what he was doing. When I made it 225 and he makes it 725, that's a feeler bet right there. He's trying to find out what uh, what I have to see if his set of sixes are good. And when he did that, I said to myself, self, what is he doing this with? I said, I've got an ace blocker. He's not going to have a set of aces, especially when he did a re-raise on uh, pre-flop. He's probably not doing that with a set of fours, especially since I have a four. I said, he's got to have a set of sixes because I still have the nut diamond draw. And uh, sure enough, he had a set of sixes, okay? He had six, six, X, X. And what I did is I flatted. It was such a bad move. And the reason why is because the flop comes a six four and the turn's a jack and you do a feeler bet uh, and you've been playing on this table for a while and your feeler bets and your blocker bets also look like your nut bets, which I've done, I did a couple times on this table. Uh, but this gentleman sat down maybe like 45 minutes ago. So he might have seen one or two of those where I bet like 200 into a $500 pot and then somebody would pot me to like 1300 and we get it all in for like 2500 and then they'd find out, wow, you had the nuts, okay? Because when you're doing block betting or feeler betting, it's important again to mix those bets in with your nut bets, okay? But in any case, when he makes it 725, he basically, he could just turn his hand over. Yeah, I've got a set of sixes. And if I repot it, if I make it $2,300, you think somebody's gonna call $1,600 with a set of sixes? Some people will, okay? Those people lose money in PLO. And the reason why is because I could have easily have turned a set of jacks there. I could have easily had a set of aces since I was first to act. My worst hand that I'm going to call with is exactly what I had, which is an ace four with diamonds or ace jack with diamonds. So in any case, I call, river comes a nine of hearts. I check and the gentleman goes in the tank forever. Uh, I shouldn't say forever, but he went in the tank for probably a solid minute. And then he checks behind and he goes, just in case you have a set of jacks or a set of aces. And when you check behind, I went, son of a bitch. I said, your sixes are good. I knew exactly what he had. And he was a good player, but that's one of those situations when you do a blocker bet or you do a feeler bet uh, or you recognize that your opponent's doing a feeler bet. And then the proper move, if they're doing a feeler bet, is to apply maximum pressure. You're going to find out that in Parliament Omaha, especially when you start getting up in stakes, when you start going to medium stakes like 5-5 five, five with a rock, 5-10-20, things like that, when people do feeler bets, they're, they're not doing it with the nuts. They're doing it with, I think I've got enough value where I can raise you, and if all you do is flat, then I think I know what you have, and therefore I can go check, check river, and there's enough in the pot, and I'm okay with that. But what throws a curveball at them is when you do one of those blocker bets of like 200 bucks, they raise it to 700, and then you just come over the top for like 2,000. Then they got to sit there and be like, oh, is this guy really doing this uh, uh, with that hand? And I'll give you, a, this is probably the best pot limit Omaha hand I've ever played in my entire life. And I got somebody to fold. 
And this is a crazy hand, and uh, it happened at MGM Detroit on absolutely one of the craziest tables I belong to. Uh, I was playing with another gentleman who's incredibly aggressive. I believe he goes by the name of Sam. If he's watching this video, I'll give you a shout out because he's an amazing PLO player. But we were playing 1-3-10, and this is an example of a, of a, of a blocker bet or of a feeler bet. And uh, the flop, I kid you not, comes jack 6-4. Now, typically it's six-way action. Again, this is a crazy table. Everybody is super deep. Uh, I think at the time I'm around $4,000 deep. Uh, the other three players that were in the hand, one was about 3,000 deep, and then another player was somewhere around $1,800 deep. So there was a total of three of us. We get to the flop on a three bet, and the flop comes jack, six, four, and my hand is king, queen, jack, I think it was like nine. King, queen, jack, nine. So literally, just top pair. Now keep in mind, this is one of those situations where you're doing a feeler bet, blocker bet, et cetera, et cetera. This table is absolutely bonkers. It's absolutely crazy. We did get three ways to the flop. Uh, I think it was like for 250 or something. My stack's the biggest stack. Uh, Sam's stack is 1800 and then the guy that I got out was $3,000. But in any case, the flop has something like $600 in it pre-flop. It was, it was a lot. So I do a feeler bet for 200 because I'm like, I got top pair. I got a, a wrap. There's so many cards in here that I can pick up equity on. And I said, and honestly, as crazy as this table is, top pair might be pretty good here. So I bet $200. The guy, so there's myself, okay, and then there's an individual, and then the guy I said, Sam. Okay, so M is myself, I as individual, S is Sam. Hopefully you guys can see that. Oh, you can't. I'll put it up here. M-I-S. And uh, so I'm first to act. I bet 200 The guy in between decides to flat. He calls for $200. Now, three hands before this, he folded pocket aces pre-flop. Uh, I think it was 1,800 pre-flop three-way action. So just to give you an idea, the guy is a little tight. He argue, he showed the whole table, and then he told everybody, well, they weren't suited. Like, what? <laughs> I don't care. In any case, so uh, I bet 200, this guy flats. Sam, uh, who is a crazy individual, decides to pot it. And uh, he pots it um, to a significant amount. And then I repot it. I just jam. And the reason why I jam, I put the little feeler bet out there because I had been playing at this table. This was a table that I stayed at for over 30 hours. I've been playing at this table at this time. I think it's been like 18 hours. And people knew that sometimes I would do a feeler bet when I had the stone cold nuts. Like if I had a set of jacks, I was betting 200. If I had one jack with all cards around it, like nine queen king, I was betting 200. So I bet 200 guy in between calls. Sam raises all in. Uh, to, I think it was pretty close to all in 1800. And then I jam, and this guy with the pair of sixes is like so stressed out. And if you're watching this video, hey, even in that situation, I probably fold. But he stands up, he shows his hand, he's talking to himself, he's pulling out his money, he's pulling out another $2,000, he's talking about the rebuy, and he's just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. And he goes like, I know I'm just gonna look at a set of jacks. I know I'm just gonna look at a set of jacks. And he does this, and no one calls time. And I'm just sitting there going, dude, this guy's got me smoked. If he calls, he's going to win a huge pot. I knew in my heart that Sam only had a jack. And I knew in my heart that my king-queen played and that my jack was going to be bigger than his. And because uh, we were on an absolutely crazy table. Oh, no, I didn't have I didn't have king-queen jack. I had ace-queen jack. Sorry. I had ace-queen jack. But in any case... Um, the guy goes in the tank forever, and this is the, 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 the strength of doing a feeler bet where you've been at a table for long enough where you end up repotting it and you've shown the nuts enough times. The guy ends up falling away, pocket sixes. And then, of course, Sam turns over his hand, and he had, I had him crush. He had king, queen, jack, eight versus my ace, queen, jack, nine. And I'll never forget because the, the turn came a king. And that was the end of that story. It was probably the best PLO hand I've ever played. Uh, that, and I ended up losing, even with that. But it was so funny because when Sam turned over his hand, I said, I know all you have is a jack. And he says to me, he goes, Josh, you're one of the best PLO players. I know all you've got is a jack. <laughs> he turned it over. It was pretty, pretty comical. Um, but yeah, so when you're doing block betting, make sure you're mixing in your block bets with uh, uh, bets that you have the Stone Cold Nuts on. And you can do the same thing on the river. If there's $800 on the river and you have the Stone Cold Nuts, and say you bet $250 on the, on the turn, it's better under 200. You're like, well, if it was 250, you know, now it's going to be worth another 200 on the river or another 250 on the river, something like that. 
it's going to confuse your opponent. And the more times you can confuse your opponent and pile them in Omaha because your bets tell your opponents what you have just as much as you looking at your chips, you looking around the table, you looking nervous, you breathing heavy, the, the, the jugular vein going thump, 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 thump. Your bet size, a lot of times with PLO players, will tell you what they have. So again, if you're new to PLO, if you're new to Parliament Omaha, you're making that transition because four cards is just sexier than two cards, be careful when you don't have anything and you do a block bet, okay? If it's the first couple times you've done it at a table, you're just better off either checking or betting pot, okay? If you have the Stone Cold Nuts, incorporate a few block bets or feeler bets in, so that way people will call you and then you can start bluffing with block bets if you want. But yeah, feeler bets, people wanna know where they're at. Block bets is when somebody bets, no one wants to be raised. So I'm gonna cover a couple of the questions now that I had asked. First of all, please like and subscribe the, uh, the channel. We definitely appreciate that. But two of the questions I got quite asked, one is, when are you gonna cover micro stakes? I believe next video is dry ace and micro stakes. I'm gonna combine those two into one because I've covered aces, suited aces a little bit. I don't think I've covered dry aces too much. Micro stakes, I, I know that there's a great field out there for them, uh, but I'll cover micro stakes with a dry ace video. And then somebody asked me from the last episode, uh, you know, what's your recommendation or can you cover a few things on short buys? So, as you guys have heard me say in the previous videos, you should always be buying in for max. When you do a short buy-in table, and maybe the situation is, is you're on a one 2 five game, and the max they let you do is 500, which is essentially 100 big blinds, okay? And you'll hear me talk a lot about big blinds when we get to tournament talk, okay? Because PLO is a completely different monster than no limit holder when it comes to tournaments. But say, for example, your max buy-in is... 100 big blinds, how do you play that a little bit differently? Um, you know, there, there's a couple different things. I think the biggest thing is, is you have to play small ball to start off with. So while your stack is $500, you have to look around and see what everybody else's stacks are. If everybody else's stacks are 500, uh, you can always, of course, bet the most amount of equity that you can. Sometimes in situations that's gonna be pot. But for the most part, I'm gonna be playing small ball, okay? Uh, what does that mean? That means if there's $60 in the pot, uh, when I do a blocker bet or a feeler bet or even a high equity bet, like if there's $60 in the pot because it was $20 pre-flop and you got three-way action, uh, on the flop, I'm not betting 60. I'm going to keep it small. I'm probably going to bet anywhere between 30 and $45. Uh, even if I get a caller and the turn comes and there's 150 in the pot, I'm probably just going to kick it up to probably like 75 to 100 bucks. I'm going to play small ball when I don't have as many big blinds uh, until I have a stack that can really start applying pressure on people. And the other thing you have to be wary of is other people who are buying in for small. So anybody who does a small buy-in, usually what they want to do is they want to rip it all in on the flop, okay? They want to see something like six, nine, jack with a spade, spade, heart, and then they have seven, eight, ten, x. And whether they have spades or not doesn't even matter. But usually if you're in a table where there's a lot of small buying in, and this happens in Chicago, or it used to happen in Chicago, whereas a one, two, five max buy-in was 500, everybody would buy in for a hundred bucks and then everybody would just ram and jam pre-flop. It was actually a really fun game, but I ran into an individual who had like 2,800 in front of him and I said, oh, you're doing pretty good. He goes, no, I'm in for, uh, what did he say? I'm in for 38 buy-ins. And I'm like, at 500 a piece? He goes, no, hundred a piece. And I was just like, whew, it's crazy. So, Again, small ball, and a lot of times when you have people who are short stacked, they're gonna wanna rip it all in, they're gonna wanna get it in on the flop versus on the turn. So you can start being a little bit more defensive where if you have like jack nine, still bet your equity, if you get raised, just flat. And that's the thing that always, people always find different. If I have a hand, like say the board six, nine jack, and, and I think my opponent's got a complete wrap, and I've got jack nine XX, and I bet, say, $25, and I get raised to, uh, say, pot, which would be like $125, I'll just flat. Why do I flat? One, I don't like to run it twice. That's, again, personal preference. We talked about that a little bit. But then I know if they have a complete wrap and the turn comes a two, a three, or a four, 
or say a king or an ace, or of course a nine or a jack, if any of those come up, then I'll lead pot into them because at that point I'm like, hey buddy, you only got one card to go. Your equity just got cut in half. You know, before where you might have had a 35% chance of winning, now you only have a 17% chance of winning because you only have one card to go, and now I'm gonna charge you maximum amount, okay? And uh, if they wake up with a set of sixes, hey, they wake up with a set of sixes and you end up losing the hand. At least it's short stack. But yeah, when you do play PLO and you're looking at stack sizes, keep in mind who's in the short stack and why are they short stacked. If you just sat down at the table, assume that they did a small buy-in, um, but be wary of that. And like I said, if I'm buying in for a short stack, first of all, I don't do that. But on some of the higher stakes games, like 10, 25, 50, you buy in for 3,000, you're pretty much buying in for a short stack. Uh, even on 5, 10, 25, if you buy in for like two or 3,000, that's pretty much the short stack. Um, but be wary of other short stacks that are out there. But uh, yeah, this covers episode seven, block betting and feeler bets. Uh, again, hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you all very much for tuning in and watching and listening. Keep the comments rolling in. And as always, play smart and run like a god.